Good news, everyone. Today, free comic book day recap. Here on... Hey, Mitch. What you doing? Introducing the show. Um, without me? It's free comic book day recap! Uh, comic books. Yeah, which is why I'm doing it. Guys, focus. Right. Hey, everybody. Today we have an awesome show for you. It's a comic book special. Be prepared for everything comics. Also, I have some Star Wars news for you and a couple of PSAs. Mitch, he has some mediocre reviews for you. They're not mediocre. Also, Jeremy will be telling us about the return of Peter Parker and Forever Evil Aftermath. Lucas has some exciting anime history for us and some recaps from Viz Entertainment. And this, this is Nerdcast. Nerdcast. To the to the, to the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger, ready to move out. What do you have against comic books? Nothing, actually. Well, then why are you all in this comic book episode? Because the three of you turn into the most obnoxious fanboys I know when it comes to comics. No, we don't. Uh, yes, you do. It's all you're talking about today besides burritos and bathroom breaks. Well, one leads into the other. Look, let's just go to news and views. Hey, guys. I'm going to start on a serious note. If you're old enough to send the SWAT team to someone's house, you're old enough to know that doing so as a joke or a payback is stupid. Sending a SWAT team to someone's house after losing a Call of Duty is a new trend, and they're calling it swatting. It's obnoxious. It wastes tax dollars, time, and just like with the airplane bomb threats, each one must be taken seriously. So the next time you lose a Call of Duty, instead of sending the SWAT team to your opponent's house, think about how if you actually learned to play the game growing up, instead of trying to use your best your mom insults on Xbox Live, you might actually be good enough to win. Just remember, your opponent won't be the only one getting a knock at their door from law enforcement. Do people really need to be told this? Come on guys, you're smarter than that. Now for some TV and movie news. That Goosebumps movie I told you about has officially started filming. It's slated to release March 23, 2016. The cast of the new Star Wars movie, Episode 7, has finally been announced and good news everyone! It's mostly new people! Psych, just kidding. We have all your old favorites. Until it's released, Maybe Netflix can hold you over, as it has reached a deal with Verizon similar to the one with Comcast, especially since they have revived another show. Go Netflix! AMC canceled their show, The Killing, but luckily Netflix was there to cast a red spell and it's coming back for its fourth and final season on August 1st. While I personally haven't seen this one, I'm going to have to watch it now simply because Netflix is helping the shows get back on its feet. Yet another trend started by Arrested Development. This is a good thing. Max Brooks wrote World War Z and the Zombie Survival Guide. Now, Legendary TV is at it again, trying to bring you his comic book series, The Extinction Parade, to TV. They're asking for Brooks' help on this one, so maybe it'll stay more true to the story than not. You can also look forward to a video game documentary in the making called Earthbound USA. They want to focus on the fans and their struggle to make the Mother series the mainstream, like Zelda. It should release next year. Also, keep your eyes out for a Kickstarter for the documentary. Is everything a Kickstarter now? No. Some of it is produced by Microsoft. Xbox Entertainment Studios is filming a documentary exclusively for Xbox One. Being the PlayStation fangirl I am, you're probably wondering why I care. Well, they're excavating a site in New Mexico that has long been thought to be a video game burial ground. That's right. Video games have made it to becoming excavated. Basically, Atari had some bad calls, and their games were doing horribly. Especially E.T., the worst game of all time. So they took their games to the dump. And now they've been found, even though Atari has denied dumping them there for years. Auntie Claus is the Christmas horror movie about Krampus, and not Nick. See, in other countries, children just don't get cold when they're bad, they get taken. Kevin Smith is making this into a movie because what's scarier than disappearing on what is supposed to be one of the happiest days of the year. Probably that news you have about Yahoo? Yahoo is jumping on the TV bandwagon, and in 2015 it will be hosting two comedy web shows, as well as giving you access to daily concerts this summer. TV is a thing again, guys! Woo! Even Nintendo has a TV remote built into the gamepad. 
And speaking of Nintendo, they have announced a new Wii U bundle for Europe, which means it will probably come here eventually too. It includes a 32GB black premium console and Mario Kart 8. Oh, and it'll be available on May 30th. Also, Nintendo has confirmed yet another themed Motion Plus controller, Yoshi. That makes four Mario controllers to one Zelda controller. Nintendo priorities. Nintendo has once again announced that it's not going to have a live E3 conference. Don't worry, they'll still have a Nintendo Direct. I swear, it's just like Christmas, coming earlier and earlier every year. Let me at least finish the school year before I can have the time to geek out. Hey, are we sure this is even news? Why are we reporting this? The fact that most horror movies are just setups for jump scares means that we as a society are dangerously disarmed against actual horror. But jump scares are baby stuff. They're fun horror. Oculus is not fun horror. Oculus is what causes you to go home, call your mom in case you die tomorrow, and cover every reflective surface in your home just in case. Mitch told us that he absolutely did not spend the night with the lights on, covered in a blanket, eating a gallon of ice cream. The movie follows two siblings, one a no-name actor fresh out of a psych ward, and the other Amy Pond with a passable American accent. Way back when, the family was torn apart by either a massive psychotic break or a possessed mirror. The brother, with his decade of therapy, is pretty sure it was his parents going spectacularly crazy, but the sister blames the mirror and has spent her life tracking it down and watching ghost hunters in preparation for a vengeance showdown with an antique. She's been preparing for this her entire life. The movie's big play here is that we as an audience don't know if we're dealing with ghosts or the delusions of severely mentally ill people. The siblings are the only characters in the house once the plot gets started, and obviously they're unreliable narrators, especially when the psychosis and or ghosts starts giving them powerful hallucinations and forces them to relive the entire traumatic experience that got the family shattering ball rolling in the first place. The ball is actually a boulder and it's rolling into the children. Whether we're dealing with a mirror full of Satan or loose screws, the audience is still subjected to some utterly twisted imagery. Most of it is body horror, and the way Oculus does it is so gross and visceral that it's almost snuff if it wasn't timed so perfectly. As our understanding of the movie dissolves with the characters based on reality, they start holding the grossness for longer and longer. It's the same principle of making people uncomfortable as a child holding a booger to your face. Only now, instead of a booger, it's that silhouette of a person standing in your closet at night. Was that a ghost? <laughs> yep, that's a ghost. Okay, you did your jump scare. You can go away now. Ghost, why are you still there? Go, go away, go away. Oculus is the movie that every film student would make if they had the time, budget, and talent. The premise is simple but executed flawlessly, and the movie finds a perfectly natural way to jump between flashbacks and the present until everything is fused into one glorious, traumatizing ride. I'm told some people found the interlocking stories hard to follow. Just remember that you're supposed to be confused by design. Uncertainty is the hollow, quivering core of horror, and Oculus left me feeling equally quivery. Oh, and the moral of the story is don't ever, ever go antiquing. If this movie is even slightly a reflection of reality, then old home decorations are not to be trusted. Little old ladies are all secret exorcists saving us from the real horrors of this world, and Antiques Roadshow is how they find targets. Basically what I'm saying is, hug your grandma, she's earned it. I have another PSA for you guys. Anything, anything hooked up to the internet is hackable. Just as the family that recently had their baby monitor, complete with camera, hacked. They had it connected to their phones that they could watch their baby easier and make sure that everything was okay with their new little bundle of joy. But some people can be just so rude. Rude? You're going with rude? Well, what word would you use? Someone hacked into the baby monitor and started harassing the kid. Here's the thing. Companies find these exploits all the time and they release updates to stop them. In a situation like this, however, you have to be the one responsible for checking it regularly. When you get a new device that connects to the interwebs, your first step should be to figure out how to update it and how often those updates come out. So update and protect yourself. 
like with Internet Explorer. In case you haven't heard, there's a very serious Internet Explorer flaw that was published a couple of weekends ago, actually. Even Microsoft said do something else. Although they're rolling out a fix for it, XP users are out of luck. Just upgrade to 7 already, guys. Or Linux. Verizon Samsung Galaxy S5 users. You might want to get a new phone. Several users are reporting camera failures. And I mean the camera never works again failures. While the rest of the phone is fine, not even a factory reset will make them usable again. This is bad news for their Galaxy K Zoom, which is 90% camera, 10% phone. Good news for Microsoft, though, because the Nokia phone cameras are all they have going for them. Too bad those sales are down by 30%. Take note, Amazon. Your phones are next. Print is also having troubles of its own. The company has lost lots of customers due to service disruption, according to the financial reports. However, they are giving six-month Spotify trials to firmly plan members. So maybe they'll just lose more money in the long run. Who knows? The MacBook Air is now slightly cheaper, yet somehow also slightly faster. Still more than I would pay for a laptop, but if you're in the business of making videos, you have a better chance of affording one now. Leapfrog has made a wearable crossover between Tamagotchi and Fitness Watch for kids, and psst, Mitch's mom, he wants it for Christmas. No, I don't. <laughs> Hi, mom. I would like to say congratulations to Mike Bithell, whose game Thomas Was Alone sold over 1 million copies, not including the PlayStation Plus downloads. He's now working on a game called Volume, and I can't wait. Thomas Was Alone is only a few hours long, but it was creative in its storytelling and definitely a game you should play if you're into indie games. And even if you're not. China is getting the Xbox One in September. We'll see how well it does now that the console ban has been lifted and keep you updated. Russia is getting more conservative, however, as it now wants bloggers to register with the government. It's all so they can try to make their government better by hearing people's complaints faster. Really. Skype group video calls are now free on Xbox One and PC. I don't know why it took them so long to make this happen. Screen sharing on Skype has also become free. I really feel like they're late to the game on this one. Comixology, which was recently purchased by Amazon, will not let you make an in-app purchase on iOS anymore because, well, they don't want to pay Apple 30% of the sales. Yeah, I wouldn't either. You can still purchase them through the website and sync to the phone after the fact, but that's a process. Or you could check out the Humble Bundle. They're having a comic book run until May 15th. Comics include Morning Glories, which is one of Jeremy's favorites, East of West, Chew, and Saga. These are digital copies, but then you can carry them all with you without the added weight. Oh, these are volumes and not just single issues, so check it out. And that's it for Nerd News today, guys. Feel free to fast forward through Mitch. We've been meaning to get to this one for a while now. Hearthstone is a collectible card game that you play on a computer. Welcome to the future. Legit though, Blizzard needed an answer to the end of their milkable paycheck World of Warcraft and they came up with Hearthstone, a card game based on World of Warcraft. Still the future. And guess what? It's just as addicting as its source material. Players build decks by selecting a Warcraftian class and using a set of restricted class cards in conjunction with a pool of neutral monster cards. The game mechanics are simple, but stack into a surprising amount of depth and combination. Decks are only 30 cards small, but it means players must manage their resources as strictly and wisely as possible, or their face explodes. <laughs> Hearthstone is also subject to a volatile metagame, and the truly dedicated, like myself, find it pays to pay attention to the game's forums and subreddit, and it's not unheard of to build decks specifically to counter whatever month's most popular deck is. The other big plus is that Hearthstone embraces the fact that it's a video game, not a strict card game like the Magic the Gathering yearly releases. And that means Hearthstone lets players do things that could never be done in a traditional card game, like spells with random effects, or cards that create copies of cards in your opponent's deck. The strategy consequences are staggering, and sometimes a good random effect can determine a game in the same way a Mario Kart power-up can determine a race. Does that mean that there's a blue shell card? And profanity, of course. Unfortunately, Hearthstone suffers from the curse of free-to-play. Players start with an extremely limited number of cards, and all those streamers can and have proven that you can play the game completely fine without paying a cent, the fastest way to get anything is shelling out cash. 
Luckily, Blizzard cooked up a clever way to balance this as well. Instead of the ability to buy individual cards with people money, players can instead buy only random packs of cards. This means no one picks up the game and buys the best cards straight off. They have to be earned. Even if someone decided to throw, say, two or three hundred dollars at this game, there's no way to guarantee there's suddenly superpowers in Azeroth's land of cards. And even if they did, they'd still need to know the intricate ways that this simple card game blooms in complexity and tactical expertise. It's tough for me to review this game when there's so much about it that I like. From the way it's balanced to the depth of strategy, I have to really nitpick to find the very specific details and flaws. That's even that old Warcraft humor and the self-aware references, like my personal favorite card, Leroy Jenkins. So basically, just go download this game. Even if you don't get super into it, you lose nothing, and it'll hold your interest over until Blizzard's next release. Hopefully, it'll be an original IP. It's a, it's a Dota clone using established Blizzard characters. Right. All right. Well, at least there's Hearthstone, right, Jess? Um, isn't this just Magic the Gathering? What are you so happy for? Did you get a new contract? Nope. It, is, there free, is there free food in the break room? Even better. You, did you find Stephanie Brown? Well, not that good, but Saturday was free comic book day. Oh, that explains it then. So, who else likes free, well, anything? Fluffernutter doesn't. He likes to make you pay. But you know what I love? Free mangas. And for those of you trying to keep up with the industry or want to see what else is out there, you should really think about picking up one of these. <gasps> How do I get my hands on one of these? Through the magic of free comic book day. These are what are called manga samplers. Now, large companies like Tokyo Pop, at least back in the day, and more recently, Viz Entertainment put these out every year in conjunction with and for the sole purpose of Free Comic Book Day. Now, what exactly are they? Well, just as I stated earlier, they are samplers. Now, imagine Shonen Jump magazine, but in a more convenient size and, well, free. Now then, they usually contain about a chapter or so from several mangas that are hot right off the presses and the ones that they want you to take a look at. Essentially, you're getting the first chapters from some of the year's best writing that their company has to offer, and they are giving it to you. Whether it's the fact that it's free or that their selections are almost always incredible, these samplers serve almost as a future shopping list for you and your newly formed or heavily ingrained manga kick. In short, they have a little bit of something for everyone. It's quality material. And like any good habit-forming bait, the first one's always free. Rye number one. This much-anticipated new addition to the already impressive Valiant Universe has a lot of hype behind it. I mean, they even moved the release date up from May to April. And I gotta say, it lives up to the hype. Impressive Valiant Universe is impressive. Valiant back in the day had a reputation for story over art. It's not that they had bad art, it's just that while everyone else in the 90s was focusing on crazy new experimental artwork, Valiant was content to stick with regular art and have more and more focus on good story. Valiant currently seems to continue that trend, but I think Rai is the exception. Clayton Crane's artwork is absolutely stunning in its depiction of technology gone wild, the serene beauty that sits outside of it, and all the people that live in this crazy world of the future. I haven't seen sci-fi run this rampant since the epic manga Blame, and I am loving it. Show me fluff and utter seal of approval. There's clearly a lot of depth built into this world as well, from the mysterious father to the ethically questionable PTAIs. Plus, you don't need to be familiar with any other Valiant series to enjoy this. Do yourself a favor, whoever kind of comic fan you are, and take a look at Rai. 10 out of 10. In honor of Free Comic Book Day, and also in memory of an industry giant long since fallen from the proverbial beanstalk, today we remember Tokyo Pop. Well, at least the U.S. branch. For those, who, for those of you who grew up really starting to love anime and manga from the late 90s through the 2000s, really, I think you'll remember this group. For those who don't, 
Tokyo Pop was and well still is, at least in Germany, one of the largest distributors, licensors, and publishers of manga over the last 20 years. Starting in 1997 as Mix Magazine, Tokyo Pop was one of the first, if not the first, to show an interest in providing content for an untapped market, teenage girls. While most entertainment bigwigs were saying, girls don't watch cartoons, and the, well, ever more infamous stereotype that girls don't read comics. Remember, it was the 90s. That's no excuse. Well, it was an era of distrust and uncertainty in the teenage female market that Tokyo Pop released its first graphic novel for, Sailor Moon, and thus fangirls as we know them today were born. A dark era for nerd kind. As the years went on, the company molded and shaped the contemporary manga industry as we know it today. They standardized the book trim size, established a rating system, developed the first manga displays for retailers, and really brought mangas to the world stage for massive consumer consumption. And by 2002, they launched their famous 100% authentic manga campaign that established for audiences of all languages that we would from then on read mangas the way they were meant to be read, from right to left. Sounds like they did a lot. And then they died. Well, times were good at least until they had to restructure in 2008. They did this to basically ward off financial hemorrhaging from low manga sales. And by 2011, after years of free manga reading sites and the collapse of borders, the U.S. offices unfortunately closed in late May of 2011. An even darker era for nerd kind. Thus marking the end of an era. Just in time for the movie Amazing Spider-Man number one. When I got to the end of the main story in this issue, I was all set to complain that these huge issues are basically never one long issue. They have a lot of shorter stories in addition to a regular length main story. And yes, Amazing Spider-Man number one does that. But in this case, pretty much all the backup stories are actually significant to the main ongoing story. What this issue is about as a whole is Peter Parker adjusting to the life that was created while Doc Ock was in control of his body. It's like getting back into your old shoes after buying them back from the thrift store, where you find out they've had other owners since. There's a lot he outright missed, and it's taking some getting used to, which makes for some really interesting storytelling. The Avengers can see right away that his sense of humor and bad luck is back, but it's going to be harder to explain things to people like Aunt May and poor unfortunate Anna Maria Marconi. The main story was amazing. Not all the backup stories were amazing, but overall, it was an excellent issue, 9 out of 10. Recently released onto paperback and Kindle is the latest installment of one of the most popular series out and about at the moment. I talk, of course, about Attack on Titan number 12. Barely been out on the market, and yet it's already getting rave reviews from fans everywhere in, an issue, in this issue. Irwin and the Survey Corps have mounted a rescue operation to retrieve Eren from the Colossus Titan and the Armored Titan. And Jupiter's Moon Titan. But there's a catch. There has been a huge deficit of their numbers recently. And well, it's starting to sound more like a death sentence for the humans. It's going to be a must read to be honest with you. And if you find yourself done reading the issue, and while you're waiting for the next one to come out, May I suggest the prequel of the series to the series, Attack on Titan Before the Fall. It explains how life was in the series before, well, the Titans attacked. It even includes a special look at a Titan worshiping cult and their downfall. What could have gone wrong? And all kinds of wonderfully horrific visuals and rich storytelling that the series has been known for. Forever Evil Aftermath, Batman vs. Bane. Forever Evil isn't over yet, but not to worry. This issue doesn't have any major spoilers or anything. All it really reveals is that the day was eventually saved. And we all knew that was how things were going to basically turn out. As Fluff and Utter hath decreed. What this really is, is Arkham War number 7. Same writer, same artist, same lettering for the title, for God's sakes. This issue begins with a nice little story that demonstrates the moral complexity that is Bane. He's not an outright villain or a monster or anything. He's actually compassionate to the people. He conquered Gotham to keep it out of the hands of the animals and madmen that inhabit Arkham. 
He even protects her streets from the assholes that would take advantage of the desperation caused by forever evil. But there's this dark little twist to the way he does things, and I'm not just talking about the way he breaks a few people's spines. It's like he's reenacting Nightfall all over the place. Maybe he's auditioning for Nightfall the Musical. He's presented perfectly here as a complex figure. But after that, it's basically what the title says, Batman versus Bane. Is it an awesome fight? Yeah, it's totally awesome. It's Batman versus Bane. But there's just something a little hollow about the fight. It just doesn't feel as potent as it should be for a full conquering hero Batman returns versus Bane, the determined king who clawed his way to the top. It should have been a little bigger, a little more intense based on the situation. But in one short issue, it had to set up and do a tiny bit of fallout as well. It just didn't, it just felt like a regular Batman versus Bane fight, not one as crazy as the situation demanded. It's still pretty good, eight out of 10. You just heard about the best on the market today. Well, let's look at a blast from the past. Do we need to do the time warp again? No, not right now at least. But in all seriousness, for American consumers, this may be one of the most overlooked and underrated mangas that I've ever had the pleasure of coming across. Coming seemingly out of nowhere from what may have been America's heyday in manga is a series called Genshiken. The story is set around a college club called the Genshiken, the Society for the Study of Modern Visual Culture. Now, what does this mean? Well, imagine combining your high school video game club and your high school anime club. Combine them together and then cut their productivity by about half. So, our show? And there you have a tight-knit club that encompasses our group of would-be heroes. We first start out with a total noob who's just enrolled in college and is in search of a club to join. Once he had gotten in, we start looking at life through his eyes, through the life of a newcomer to this organization. We look at trips he makes to cons and shops with the group. Next, we start going from character to character to explore their life in essentially what is a slice of life for otaku life. It's an outrageously great comedy from the early 2000s, and I highly suggest it. It's gracing the bookshelves of bookstores and comic shops everywhere, and there's really no excuse not to pick this up. And finally, Future's End number zero. First of all, this issue is free. There's absolutely no excuse for you not to have this if you're any kind of DC fan. Okay, there's gotta be a catch. No catch? This is nothing reprinted. This is entirely all new material. An entire issue's worth. 20 full pages. I counted. And it's not just a sort of preview, promo, kind of half-ass sneak peek at Future's End. This is the true and full beginning of the Epic Weekly series, and boy does it look epic. The future is painted as an extremely bleak place, the result of the machinations of such fan-favorite characters as Maxwell Lord and Brother I. One of the things I really liked was how this issue demonstrates what kind of characters will be in focus. Characters of the best canceled New 52 series like Frankenstein, Amethyst, and Blue Beetle took a lot of spotlight in this issue, foreshadowing major roles for them in the weeks to come. This is great for anybody like me, frustrated with a lot of quality books being canceled before their times because they focused on lesser known heroes. This issue is also drawn by all the artists who are set to draw the weekly series in rotation, and their styles all complement each other well, and no artist really looks bad. Their styles are all good, and there's not going to be a whole lot of jarring transitions. Future's End has a dark future in the story, but a bright future in terms of quality. For being a free issue, it's 10 out of 10. You monster. Bottom number three this week is Origin 2 number five. Beautiful artwork, but such a sloppy and lackluster conclusion to the story with a really obnoxious fake out. At the top of the bottom for anime, well, in this case, manga this week, we're looking at you, Bleach. You don't clean anything, and to be honest, your character development's pretty lacking. It's amazing you made it through to the 50s in your volumes. Number two worst comic this week was Shadow Man, End Times number one. There's some good character work, but there's too much recap for the first issue of only three. At number two for our worst manga of the week, we're looking at the entire series of Wedding Peach. Think about it like this. 
It's kind of like Sailor Moon meets Card Captors in a cluster nutter of disappointment and genericism. Yes, I really just had to make up a word just to review this. And the worst comic this week was Avengers AI number 12. The climax of the series had a lot of epic elements to it, but there were some weird religious themes that show up out of nowhere and God is a bald parrot or something. I don't even know. For a series that was about robots and stuff, it took a weirdly religious turn. Our number one of the worst manga this week, Duel Masters. Really? Really? D did we really need this one this week? Yeah, I, I don't even think they can give it away at this point. The hype. Number three for our best anime of the week. Well, in this case, we're looking at manga because we have Attack on Titan number 12. It may never run out of steam soon, but hey, it's a little bit heavy for springtime if you ask me. The third best this week was Future's End number zero. It was free and it was fantastic. Our number two manga this week is I Am Here. It's a slice of life with rich storytelling that is just right. Number two best comic this week was Chew number 41. Because Chew, like Morning Glories and Manhattan Projects, pretty much always has a slot in these tops. It's so good all the time. And in our top spot for anime, and in this case manga as well, Footy Kuri. It's a classic, it's a must-see, and to be honest, ask yourself this. What other series will have kids ripping guitars out of their heads. The best comic this week was Rye number one. It was awesome, it was beautiful, it had intrigue, it had everything, it was perfect. So it's the second half. Yeah. And you're making that stupid face because it's all about comic books. Yeah. And we're starting with? Good, bad, random. What's the topic? Comic books. <sighs> <sighs> Good, bad, random, comic book crossovers, everybody. Good. When an epic crossover works, it really works. There's some awesome, huge scale stories that can be told with all the tie-ins, and it's just epic, like Blackest Night or House of M. Bad. Too many can cause what's known as even fatigue, where you just want some casual storylines to break up the epic ones. I mean, too many epic ones in a row, and they really lose their impact. Random. JL apes and Marvel apes. Good. Sometimes, you need the crossovers to tell the whole story. Like with Death of the Family or The Court of Owls, the tie-ins showing the other characters' actions as part of this larger framework made the story feel more complete. Sometimes it gets just way, way out of hand, and you have about a hundred miscellaneous tie-ins and no idea which ones are important or even relevant. Random. Sometimes tie-ins to series will just pop up for no reason. Like, Batman Zero Year, what should we tie in here? Well, probably Nightwing, maybe Red Robin, and uh, yeah, the Flash and Green Lantern. Good. You get to take a look at series that you might not normally be reading and might enjoy. Like, I initially passed on Guardians of the Galaxy. I just wasn't sure. But I'm really glad they had a crossover with all new X-Men, because as soon as I checked out Guardians of the Galaxy's part, I fell in love with it, and now it's one of my favorite series. Bad. Sometimes you have to get a whole bunch of series you normally don't read to keep up with just one of the crossovers. And if you're on a budget for time and money because you're a college student, come on guys. Random. Marvel's fear itself. Was it about all the characters facing their darkest fears? No! Everyone gets magic hammers! Oh, oh hey Lucas, Lucas, come here, look at this. This is so cool. What? Is, is that a guy dressed like Wonder Woman? No, no, I mean, yeah, that, that's there, but no, 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 oh, look, look over here. Oh, that is pretty cool, actually. I know, right? It's, it's, like, it's like free comic book day is like a mini convention. Yeah, but better, because you get free comics. Oh, yeah, whoa, whoa, check out that, ba check out oh. that Batman. We've got to share this with the viewers. Free comic book day, everybody. But look, Stephanie Brown. Where? Nerdcast, we are here at Free Comic Book Day, Third Eye Comics in Annapolis. I'm here to support Third Eye, the best comic book store in the area. At least fully functional up to, I assume it can't do holograms yet. 
today I'm here with the 501st Legion, our local garrison, which is the name of like groups we have in different states or locations, is Old Line Garrison. We cover Maryland and DC. And so we're just here to promote ourselves and take pictures with kids. We're a, we're a charity organization who uses screen accurate costumes. Hey, so, 45 minutes in, it's still massively wrapping around the building. <laughs> Not a specific comic. I want to get. A, I want to take advantage of like the statues, like the uh, action figure deals. Man, I just came here to sleep on the sidewalk. <laughs> I just love the, I just love the people, dude. Oh no, you're having a shot. No, why? I have to run through the door. No, stop. And what gets you in the door before all the other losers outside? Uh, it was this little bookmark looking thing right here. But um, when you went to all of these signings, they had their March to Free Comic Book Day. It started in March. You uh, get get the signature that you came here, and we got to get in a half hour early, which is about to run out now. That's why everybody's scrambling. <laughs> when you're a nerd, you move from one line to a slightly smaller line. There's these guys again. <laughs> All the way down. And we're gonna go around. One can We've done it, Nerdcast. We made it to the line. We made it to the goal. So, what's the strategy here? We just smash and grab? I'm grabbing everything. Mega Man, Street Fighter, uh, the Tick. The hardest part about being at Free Comic Book Day is that I just want to walk around here and buy things, and I didn't come here to buy things. I'm supposed to be working. Just a land. Team kicks off soon, should be out in a few weeks, um, and it starts a really big, brutal, life-altering story arc for Chaz and for New Texas. He can die happy now. You may have actually killed him. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just, uh, I wanted to point out, dreams do come true. I thought I missed it, but I was able to find a copy of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comic. I can tell you it's really, really damn good. See, Jess, that wasn't so bad. You survived. Yeah, but where's my special? I want my own special. Well, like, E3's in like a month. June 10th, it will be my special. It will be a magical, glorious Wonderland adventure. And it'll be two episodes long, so I can geek out. That sounds wonderful. Can I geek out with you? Yes, we can geek out together. I just geek out more. Well, that's our show, everybody. Join us next week and check us out on YouTube at Nerdcast Laurel. Also, follow us on Facebook and Twitter with the same name. And we'll see you next week. Tell me next week. I was asking, don't imply inflection in my words. Tell me when I can go. I did. I said you could go. You said hold. Well then. Why'd you write so many hard words right next to each other? Because I'm words. I like words. I'm eighty thousand dollars in debt, so I have an understanding of words. You have to do a TV show. Searching for Stephanie Brown, a twenty-four year long movie called My Life. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Why are you touching me? Comic books. Comic book crossovers. Comic book things. Dry run is okay, it's dry run. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't really know how to say this to you, Jeremy, but you, sir, as much as you may try to hide or deny it, you are a ginger, and we will judge you for that. That's scarier than being taken on what is supposed to be one of the happiest days of the year. That was horrible, probably. I could do a whole bunch. Or Firefox, or Google Chrome, or Windows 8. Point one. Meow in the meow meow, bada bing, bada boom, Betty boop. So it's the second half. <laughs> Sorry, I need a minute. <sighs>
It's the same principle of uncomfortable as a child holding a Good. Sometimes you get to take a look at series that you're not normally reading. Like, I'm really glad that Guardians of the Gal... No, I did that wrong. Let me start over. Facebook link, https, forward slash, forward slash, colon dot, Facebook, dot, and then she zoomed up. That's all I saw. Uh, but, 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 but that's all, folks.